My name is Elaine, and at 55, I find myself in the sterile quietude of a hospital room, the IV drip a constant reminder of the battle I'm facing, cancer. The cold touch of the sheets is a stark contrast to the warmth I used to feel at home, now a distant memory. Fifteen years have lapsed since I walked down the aisle to George, a widower with a bright-eyed daughter, Mia. She was ten, all pigtails and toothy smiles, eagerly accepting me not just as her father's wife, but as a mother in spirit. She became the daughter I never had, the unexpected joy in a marriage I thought would fill the pages of my life with love and companionship. George was a man of stature, a businessman whose allure was as much about his charisma as it was the way he seemed ready to build a new life with me. But time has a way of eroding facades, and his once tender patience gave way to relentless demands. I'd trudge home from my job as a financial analyst, a role that demanded precision and left little room for error, only to find a second shift awaiting me, a test of my domestic diligence I was bound to fail in his eyes. I remember his exacting standards, the way he'd scrutinize the dinner table. Elaine, is this the best you could do? He'd ask, barely looking at the carefully prepared dishes before him. His words were like weights, each one piling on until I felt I could barely stand. Yet I continued to cook, clean, and care for him, even when my body screamed for rest. My parents, God bless them, would often tell me, Elaine, you need to take care of yourself too. But their advice would fall on deaf ears. I was too caught up in the cycle of appeasement. It's during one of these silent meals that my cell phone vibrates, startling me from my thoughts. It's Mia. Her voice is a balm to my tired spirit. Mom, how are you holding up? I try to sound stronger than I feel. I'm hanging in there, sweetie. How are you? She's silent for a beat too long, and I know she's carrying a weight too heavy for her young shoulders. I'm worried about you, Mom. Dad, he doesn't seem to care. Her words are a punch to the gut, but not unexpected. George's absence in these sterile white walls has been as loud as the blips on the monitors beside me. Mia, love, I know, it's okay. We have each other, I say, the words tasting like a mix of sadness and resolve. There's a pause, and then her voice, laced with a quiet strength, comes through. We do, and I'm here, every step of the way. Don't worry about Dad. Worry about getting better. Her reassurance is the anchor I didn't know I needed. When she visits, we don't talk about George, or the cold dinners, or the way his eyes no longer held any warmth for me. Instead, we talk about her job, the book she's reading, the life she's building. Her resilience and independence make me proud, and I cling to the fact that I played some part in shaping the incredible woman she's become. I lie back, closing my eyes as Mia's promises echo in my mind. The hospital room feels less confining somehow, as if her words have breathed life into its corners. I am not alone, and that's a thought worth holding on to. The day starts before the sun peeks over the horizon, my alarm clock a relentless foe. I'm up, pulling on the clothes I laid out the night before, my movements as automatic as the coffee maker that sputters to life in the kitchen. George is still asleep, the rise and fall of his chest the only evidence of life. At work, the numbers and spreadsheets are a welcome distraction. They don't complain, they don't demand, they just exist in their black and white cells, waiting for me to make sense of them. My colleagues are another story, buzzing around with office gossip and weekend plans. Elaine, you've got to come out with us one of these Fridays, Janet from accounting says, popping her head into my cubicle. I manage a smile, though I can't remember the last time I had plans that didn't involve George or a grocery list. Thanks, Janet. Maybe next time. She gives me a sympathetic pat on the shoulder before buzzing off to her next conversation. Home again, the routine continues. I'm chopping vegetables for the stew George likes when he walks in, early from work. His mood's a toss-up. I brace myself for whatever version of him is coming through the door. Smells good, he says, which feels like a small victory. I let out the breath I've been holding. It should be ready in about an hour, I respond keeping my tone even. He grunts, disappearing into the living room. The TV comes to life, and I'm left alone in the kitchen with the carrots and potatoes. I find comfort in the rhythm of my knife against the cutting board, a simple, predictable sound. 
Later, we sit across from each other at the dining table, a chasm of unsaid words between us. He's scrolling through his phone, barely acknowledging the meal. It's good, he mumbles after a few minutes, but there's a distance in his voice that's become all too familiar. I nod, my own phone lighting up with a text from Mia. Thinking of you, Mom. Hope dinner went well. I type back a quick, love you, and slip the phone back into my pocket. George looks up, eyes narrowing. Was that Mia? Yeah, just checking in, I say, trying to keep the conversation light. He nods, going back to his phone, and we finish dinner in silence. I clean up, the clinking of dishes filling the empty air. Tomorrow will be the same, the grind wearing away like waves on a cliffside, constant and relentless. But tonight, Mia's message is a lifeline, a reminder that not everything is as cold and unforgiving as this routine. There's warmth there, love, and it's enough to keep me going for one more day. The hospital room's constant beeps and murmurs are background noise as I'm lost in thought. It's during one of these quiet moments that Mia walks in, her face etched with worry. I can tell she's bearing a weight, the kind that's ready to topple over. She pulls a chair close to my bed, takes my hand, and sighs deeply. Mom, there's something you should know, she begins, her voice a mix of anger and sorrow. I squeeze her hand, encouraging her to continue. What is it, Mia? It's about Dad, she pauses, gathering her thoughts. He, he has someone else. The words hang heavily between us. I had felt the presence of someone in our lives, an invisible intruder, but hearing it confirmed sends a chill through me. He introduced her to me, Mom, Mia's voice cracks, as his future wife. The air feels thick, like I'm breathing through cotton. I try to absorb the shock, to maintain some sense of composure for Mia's sake, but inside, I'm reeling. When? The word comes out as a whisper. Last week. He told me he was serious about her, Mia replies her eyes not leaving mine, a silent apology in her gaze. There's a long pause as I process this betrayal. Thank you for telling me, sweetheart, I managed to say at last. How long have you known? Just a few days, she admits. I didn't want to upset you, but I thought it's better you hear it from me. The dull hum of the hospital seems to fade into silence. I'm grateful for her honesty, yet the pain is sharp, unyielding. I nod feeling an odd sense of calm amidst the turmoil. We'll deal with this, I say, more to convince myself than to reassure her. Mia leans forward, resting her forehead against our clasped hands. I'm here for you, Mom, whatever you need. I draw a deep breath, my mind already turning. My husband's betrayal is a deep cut, but I won't let it be the end of my story. There's a plan forming, a way out of the mess he's made. And in this sterile hospital room, with my stepdaughter by my side, I feel the first stirrings of a future where I am no longer in the shadows of a loveless marriage. I will rise from this with a cunning that's been honed by years of quiet observation. George may have underestimated me, but he'll soon learn that's his mistake. I look at Mia, her strength becoming my own. Let's start planning, I say, and there's a new determination in my voice. Our bond, unbroken by the lies that surround us, is the foundation we'll build upon. And as Mia smiles, a small, fierce smile, I know we'll win this battle together. The next day, Mia arrives with her laptop tucked under her arm and a look in her eyes that says she means business. She pulls up a chair next to my hospital bed, opens her laptop, and looks straight at me. Okay, Mom, let's talk strategy, she says with a determined nod. I can't help but smile at her spirit. I've been thinking about that, I admit. I want to be fair, but also, I want to protect myself and my future, and yours. Mia nods, her fingers poised over the keyboard. First things first, we should get a lawyer, someone who can help us navigate the divorce smoothly. I agree. Yes, a lawyer, and we'll need to gather all the financial documents. I've got most of them at home in the safe. We can go through them together, Mia offers. What about the house and the rest of the assets? I've been doing some math, I start, feeling the edge of the bed with my fingers. The house, I think I'll let him have it. Mia frowns, surprised. Really, are you sure? I nod firmly. 
I want a fresh start, somewhere new, without the memories. Plus, I've got something he doesn't know about. Her eyebrows raise in curiosity. What's that? The investment account, I say. The one my father helped me set up. It's in his name, technically, but it's mine. There's quite a bit of money there, enough for a new place and a comfortable life. Mia's eyes widen. He doesn't know about that? No, and he won't, I state. That money was from before we married. It's separate, and I want to keep it that way. Mia types away, probably making notes. Got it. We keep that account quiet. We should also think about alimony or any spousal support. I shake my head. I don't want his money, but I won't say no if it's offered. It could be useful. Okay, Mia says. And after the legal stuff is sorted? That's when I start my new life, I say, looking out the window. I want to travel, see places I've always dreamed of, when I'm well, of course. Mia reaches out and squeezes my hand. You'll get well, Mom, and I'll be right there with you wherever you go. I squeeze back, feeling a surge of gratitude for this girl. No, this woman, who's been my rock. We're in this together, I tell her, and it's more than just about the plan. It's about us, our journey ahead, and the unspoken understanding that we're a team now. The afternoon sun casts long shadows across my bed as we continue to plot, not just for the end of my marriage, but for the beginning of something new. Just the two of us, ready to face whatever comes next. A few days had passed since Mia and I had put together a plan. Lying on my hospital bed, I felt a mixture of anticipation and anxiety about setting our plan into motion. Mia walked into the room, her face flushed from the cold outside. All right, it's time, she said, sitting down beside me. Are you sure you're up for this, Mom? I nodded, the IV in my arm a stark reminder of my current weakness, but my resolve was strong. I'm sure, it's now or never. Mia took out her phone, her thumb hovering over the screen. I'm about to text Dad. I'll tell him that you want to discuss the divorce and that you're willing to talk settlement. That'll get his attention, I murmured, the bitterness in my voice belying my calm exterior. Mia sent the text, and we waited. It didn't take long for her phone to buzz. She read the message and looked up at me. He's biting, wants to come over tomorrow to talk terms. I couldn't help the wry chuckle that escaped my lips. Talk terms, huh? All right, when he comes, let him believe he's in control. That's the bait. Mia frowned slightly her concern for me clear. And you're okay with this? With him coming here and acting like, like he's one? I reached for her hand, my grip firmer than it had been in days. It's just an act, Mia, remember that. We're letting him think he's one because it's the only way to get what we need from him. Mia squeezed my hand back, her own determination returning to her eyes. Okay, mom, I trust you. And I added, make sure he sees the safe when he comes. It's empty, but he doesn't know that. If he thinks there's something valuable in there, it'll keep him focused on the wrong thing. She nodded, making a mental note. Got it, and after he leaves? We proceed with the divorce as planned, but remember, whatever happens, don't let on about the money. That's our ace. Mia stood up, her phone in her pocket. I won't. We'll get through this, just like you said, together. As she walked out, I lay back against my pillow, closing my eyes. This was just the beginning, but I had to believe that it would lead to an end. Our end, one where Mia and I could move forward, free from the shadows of deceit that had loomed over us for far too long. The morning light crept through the blinds, casting lines across the hospital room floor. I had barely slept, thoughts whirling about the upcoming confrontation. I tried to steady my breathing, the rhythmic beeping of the monitor beside my bed, a constant reminder of my situation. There was a knock on the door, and Mia peeked in, her face serious. He's here, Mom, I nodded, sitting up a little straighter. Let him in. Mia opened the door, and in walked George, my soon-to-be ex-husband. He had a smirk on his face that made my stomach turn, but I kept my expression neutral. Hello, George, I said, my voice steady. Didn't expect to see you looking so... alive, he sneered, taking a seat without being offered one. So, what's this about a settlement? I took a deep breath. 
I want to keep things simple. No dragging this out. You can have the house. His smirk widened. That's generous of you. What's the catch? No catch, I replied, meeting his gaze. I just want to end this cleanly. I'm tired, George. I don't have the energy for a fight. Mia watched, her face a mask of control. George's eyes flicked to her and then to the safe in the corner of the room. I suppose you'll be wanting support then? He asked, a greedy glint in his eyes. I shook my head slightly. No, I don't want your money. I'll manage on my own. He leaned back, looking suspicious. What's your game here? You're giving up everything. What are you hiding? Nothing to hide, I said, allowing a hint of fatigue to seep into my voice. I just want peace, George, and I think you do too. He snorted. Yeah, peace, with a young, beautiful woman waiting for me. Mia's hand clenched into a fist, but she didn't speak. I hope she makes you happy, I said quietly. George stood up, looking around the room once more. Fine, I'll have my lawyer call yours. We'll get this over with. As he reached the door, he paused and looked back at me. You're a fool, you know that? Letting go of everything without a fight. I met his gaze, my own eyes clear. Maybe, but sometimes, letting go is the only way to move forward. George shook his head and left, the door closing with a soft click behind him. Mia rushed to my side. Are you okay, Mom? I nodded, feeling a weight lifting off my shoulders. I'm fine, it's done. Now we just have to follow through. Mia hugged me, her presence a comfort. You're the bravest person I know. I hugged her back, allowing myself this moment of warmth. Brave? Maybe. But I'm not in this alone, am I? No, Mom, Mia whispered. Not alone, never alone. The ink on the divorce papers wasn't even dry when Mia dropped the bomb about the money. She was hesitant at first, biting her lip in that way she does when she's nervous. But I urged her on, knowing that whatever came next was just another scene in this absurd play my life had become. Dad knows about the three million, Mom, Mia said, her voice barely above a whisper. I sighed, not surprised. I expected as much. What's his play? It didn't take long for him to make his move. The next day, he was at my hospital room door, his eyes wide with a mix of greed and desperation. He knelt by my bed, taking my hand in his. I've been a fool, he started, his voice trembling with feigned emotion. Please. Let's put all this behind us and start over. I looked at him, really looked at him, and I felt nothing. It was liberating. I couldn't help but laugh, a genuine, deep laugh that I hadn't felt in years. Start over, I said, pulling my hand away. There's nothing to start, George. It's done. His face turned an ugly shade of red, the mask slipping. You think you can mock me? He hissed. I'll take you to court. I'll take every penny of that money. That money, I said calmly, almost enjoying this, is safely out of your reach. It's in my father's name. There's not a thing you can do about it. His eyes bulged and he spluttered, his anger a living thing between us. But before he could form words, security was at the door, alerted by the commotion. They didn't even need to speak. Their presence was enough. George's outburst was his final act, his curtain call. As they escorted him out, his shouts echoed down the hall, a pitiful sound that faded with each step. I leaned back against my pillows, a sense of peace settling over me. Mia, who had stood by the door, her face a mix of worry and anger, finally let out a long breath. Are you okay, Mom? I reached for her hand, a smile playing on my lips. I am now, sweetheart, it's truly over. We sat in silence for a moment, the weight of the past lifting, leaving room for something new, something better. And as the door closed on the last vestige of my old life, I felt ready to face a new day. It was a clean slate, a true new beginning, and I was ready to write my own story. Life after cancer and George felt like stepping out of a long, dark tunnel into sunlight. I bought a house with a big garden Somewhere Mia could visit whenever she wanted. A place that felt like ours, truly ours. One afternoon, 
Mia and I were sitting on the porch, sipping lemonade and watching the sun dip below the trees. She had been helping me unpack boxes, turning the house into a home. Her laughter was a frequent sound here, echoing off the walls, filling spaces that had known too much silence. You know, Mom, Mia said, her eyes scanning the yard. I've never seen you this relaxed. I smiled, feeling the warmth of the sun on my face. I have a lot to be thankful for. I beat cancer, I'm free of George, and I have you. She squeezed my hand. I'm just glad you're finally putting yourself first. You always took care of me, even when I wasn't your responsibility. I shook my head. You were always my responsibility, Mia. The moment I decided to be your mom, that was it. You were my family. Mia's eyes misted over, and she gave me a teary smile. I'm glad he's out of our lives. I've never liked how he treated you. And now, we don't have to deal with his drama anymore. The sun had almost set, and the sky was a canvas of purples and oranges. I stood up, feeling more alive than I had in years. Let's go inside. I'll make us dinner. Our favorite, spaghetti and meatballs. She hopped up, following me into the kitchen. Can I help? She asked, rolling up her sleeves. Of course, you can start by rolling the meatballs. We moved around the kitchen together, a dance we had perfected over years of cooking side by side. As I watched her hands, so much like mine, shaping the meatballs, a sense of contentment washed over me. This is what real family feels like, I thought. There were no harsh words here, no expectations or disappointments. Just me and Mia, and a future we could shape into whatever we wanted. Our laughter and the aromatic sense of our shared cooking efforts filled the kitchen, and I knew, deep down, that this was what happiness felt like. After years of just going through the motions, I was finally living, and I had the real family, my daughter, to thank for it.